please welcome Chris Yike. Hey everybody. How is everyone this afternoon right after lunch? Bellies are full, no one's gonna fall asleep, that kind of thing, right? Um, so I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about alignment. Um, just by way of introduction, my name is Chris Yike, I work for Dun & Bradstreet, and I run Dun & Bradstreet's content marketing arm. Um, we have a team of 10 people spread out throughout the United States, and we create all different types of assets that helps move the needle for uh, conversions, for demand generation, and meeting our business goals as a whole. We'll talk a little bit about what that looks like from a, a philosophical standpoint, from a team perspective, and, and in terms of the approach that we take, we're a brand, uh, we've got 5,000 employees worldwide, we are a data company. For those of you who don't know us, we have the largest B2B commercial uh, database in the planet. We've got over 290 million business records, sourced from 30,000 sources, and it's updated five million times a day. It's all B2B data that can be used for leveraging how many people or how many companies you want to partner with. Uh, what do they look like? Are they the right customer choice for you if you're targeting customers? Um, are you looking to partner overseas with some entities that you may not know about? You want to make sure that they're reputable and they're trustworthy. You can use our data for that information as well. So it, our data is really meant to, to do a bunch of different things to help businesses succeed, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, my background, I've been with Dun & Bradstreet for about a year and a half. Prior to that, I worked for several uh, content marketing agencies, several ad agencies and marketing PR agencies. And before that, I was a journalist, a B2B journalist for about 15 years. So I consider myself to be a writer. When somebody asks me what I, what I do, it's typically I say a writer. Um, and I try to take as many cues as, I, as I've learned from my publishing background and try to impart that into the, ph the philosophies of how we approach content marketing at Dun & Bradstreet as a brand. So we're gonna talk through several things today. Um, um, really, at the core of what we're gonna be getting at here is collaboration and alignment. I'll use that word quite a bit today. Um, we are also gonna talk about creating mutual objectives. Um, and I say that because when we talk about how we on the content marketing side of things view asset creation, content development, moving the needle, we need to make sure that our counterparts on the product marketing team are in lockstep with us. And that means ongoing collaboration. Oftentimes, I don't know, uh, how, just by a show of hands, how many people are here working for a brand currently? Okay. And do you, show of hands, uh, are you comfortable and satisfied with the level of communication that takes place between your content marketing arm and your product marketing arm? No, okay. Um, it's, an, it's an issue that we all suffer from, and we'll talk a little bit about some of what we suffered from um, and how we're trying to course correct things and, and again, mutually achieve success within our own, within our own ranks. We'll talk about uh, a subject that's near and dear to, I think, all of our hearts, data-driven insights, what that looks like in terms of informing next steps, both on the front end of discovery and on the back end of uh, content performance and optimization. We'll talk a little bit about tone and voice and writing style and how we actually um, apply that to the needs of our, our, our audiences. We, um, we have many different audiences. We'll talk about what our typical uh, LOBs, our lines of business look like, and, uh, and how we actually craft content to meet the, the needs of individual people. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, activation, where people are. You know, in, in the right channels, where they're, they're currently living, eating, sleeping, breathing, consuming content versus having them hunt and peck for things. So, uh, again, it's all about alignment. Um, a show of hands again, how many people here are married? Okay. How many people are not married but have significant others? Pretty much everybody in the room. Okay. What is it like when you are in alignment with your significant other? Feels pretty good, right? You're not fighting, things are happy, you're, you're able to, to live your life in a meaningful way and know that, you're, that your partner is also feeling good as well. How many people here, show of hands, are in, into sports and play in a team of some sort? Okay. You, all, you know as well that 
unless you're doing your golfing or something like that, a singular sport, you rely on your teammates for success. Without that alignment and collaboration up front with strategic planning, you're not gonna make your goals, you're not going to succeed, et cetera. Um, and then the last analogy, I, I'm a musician, I play the piano, I love music. How many people are here, here are musicians? I think there's probably a lot of creative people. All right, I see a very fervent musician back there, nice. Um, when I think about alignment, I think about different teams. I'm, I'm trying to apply a, philosoph a philosophy of, of the way I view music and harmony to the business realm. And so I really do equate alignment with harmony, and, and it's the same analogy that I made with relationships and with sports. Um, it's not just one person. You can't have harmony from a soloist. It's one single note. You have to have two or more people working together to achieve the same goal, know what they're gonna do up front, sing the same song, the chorus sounds beautiful, and you have harmony. So we, I'm trying to apply this principle to the way that we actually work at Dun & Bradstreet within our content marketing arm as a, as a unit, but also in the way that we work alongside of our, our product marketing team. So the first bullet point that I had shown before is working collaboratively to, to achieve mutual goals. This, this all will sound very simplistic. I try to think of, of things um, with the complexities of content marketing, as you all know. Um, you can get so deep into the weeds that sometimes you lose sight of your initial strategy or in your vision. So we try to think of things in terms of the most simplistic terms as possible. Um, and so working collaboratively to achieve a mutual goal means that you need to talk with each other up front. You need to set a charter. You need to set business goals. You need to set a project brief. You know, all those staples that we all take for granted. I think a lot of times we move so fast that oftentimes some things in terms of process get left behind. That's never a good thing. Um, we, I can say this from firsthand experience, at Dun & Bradstreet there's always something going on that comes out of left field. My, try as we might to plan for things. Um, there will always be those initiatives, those campaigns that come out of the blue and we have to be prepared for them, but we also need to apply the rigor and the discipline of process to make sure that we are on the same page. We are singing from the same, the same uh, hymnal, the same songbook. We're, we're, we're all really meant to achieve the same goal. So what does that look like for us? Um, on the content marketing side of the fence, we have a mission statement, a charter, um, and it's provide people with relevant and actionable insights about meaningfully using data to overcome business challenges, build stronger relationships, and to thrive. Again, we're a data company, so data is kind of the foundational undercurrent of all of our narratives in some way, shape, or form. Um, and you notice I didn't use the word customer here. I believe in our keynote presentations that we heard earlier today, we really need to focus a lot on humanization, and we often lose sight of that with buyer personas and, and customer types and prospects. They're all important, but when, you, when it comes down to it, even within the B2B space, which oftentimes can be somewhat dry compared to B2C, we're all people, and people have needs. They have job needs. They have challenges to overcome, to succeed within whatever organization they're working within. So we try to look at our audiences as people versus a persona. Uh, on the flip side of that, when it comes to our, our product marketing friends, they too have have a goal as well, and that's to provide people with helpful information about what our product or solution is designed to do, how it works, and what opportunities it can help un uncover. You can see some symmetry between these things and the way that we're describing using language. At the end of the day, we're, we're really here jointly to help people solve problems, to do things better, smarter, faster. Now, when it comes to product marketing, obviously the focus is on product. So we're gonna talk about our solutions and our, the features and the benefits and the nuts and bolts of how something works to help somebody overcome a problem and to do things better and smarter and faster. Same thing holds true in the content marketing side of the fence too. Oftentimes I think that we are viewed on the content marketing team as just doing that thought leadership stuff. That stuff at the top of the funnel that is really great for brand affinity but what does it do for conversion? And we work very hard to make sure that we have balance from top, middle, to bottom funnel so that we have a common 
narrative thread with consistent messaging all the way through. Uh, when, it, when we get to the point where we can talk about our products and solutions, we've already set the stage for, we understand your business, here's the challenges that you are facing as a CFO within a trade credit organization, for example, or a CIO um, within a microchip manufacturer, et cetera, et cetera. You, we, we target the needs of, uh, of the people that we're trying to help. And we focus then on creating messaging the, from, again, from the continuum of the customer journey that's gonna meet somebody's need no matter where they come in to get that information. And when I say where they come in, we're, I'm talking primarily about website content. We do a lot of other content too, but um, primarily most of our stuff lives online. So when it comes to that collaboration, we haven't always done a great job of working together on aligning those goals. And it just sounds so simple. Can't you guys just talk to each other? Can't you guys just make sure that you have the same project brief? And that simplicity, again, is oftentimes lost with the, oh my god, get it done now, get it done now. So we have multiple lines of business that we need to support, as I'm sure you do as well, within the, the brand space. We've got multiple competencies as well that we need to support. And the problem is, each one of those uh, areas has different teams. They have different ways of doing things. They have different philosophies of how to, how to strategize and how to execute, um, and different processes, different tools as well. The more complexity that you add, the harder this becomes to align. Um, the problem for us, the biggest challenge for us, is that we support them all. We, we from trade credit to master data and analytics, to sales and marketing, to supply and compliance, and to our alliances and partners' lines of business, we support every single one of those things. They each have their own stakeholders. They each have their own unique needs. And when it comes to content marketing, we need to make sure that we're understanding what those needs are and working collaboratively and jointly and effectively to, again, as a unified team, come together and build great content that's actually gonna move the needle. So, we had an opportunity, um, I guess it was about a year ago at this point. We, uh, we wanted to prove out a theory. We, we had a split, we had a schism between content marketing and product marketing. And it was always one of those things where we would build content using all of our research and methodologies up front. And when it got to the point where the product marketing piece of the story needed to be told, there was a disconnect. We weren't collaborating early, early on. We didn't produce content that was actually gonna be relevant for somebody that would come into the middle of the funnel, for example. And we always, when we talk about funnel, we presume as marketers that people are always gonna follow a linear path and start at the beginning. And that's not the reality of the world, right? So there was a big disconnect. And what we thought was we have an opportunity to ask someone to join our team uh, within our sales and marketing competency and take the knowledge that she had and within the product marketing sphere and apply it to our content marketing team. And the net result of that would be a constant line of communication, a foundational understanding of product marketing, now on our content marketing team to serve as an open line of dialogue between the two teams. And it worked. Um, and that person literally sits right next to the product marketing team. And what we found is that we have that synchronicity. We, she is in constant contact, daily content, contact with the product marketers, understanding the fundamentals of the, the products and solutions that we, we actually provide is very helpful in helping to drive some of that top funnel thought leadership content so we have that consistent story from start to finish. We have an open dialogue um, uh, ongoing about new features, new benefits that are coming out with our products and our solutions. That's key as well, always keeping up to date, optimizing content. We share our content calendars. We have a, um, a pretty rigorous discipline when it comes to calendaring, and those weren't really ever shared before with our content marketing, I'm sorry, our product marketing folks. So today, that is, uh, that's a resident part of how we operate. And again, a steady stream dialogue back and forth. What we've also done here is, this has been such a successful thing, 
but it's only been applied to one line of business. We have all those other LOBs that I mentioned earlier that we support. What we've done in the recent past, and actually by recent, I mean last week, we rolled out this model with our content marketing team. We, um, this is a serious decisions inspired model. Um, again, we have a sm rather small team, 10 people on the team. But what we're doing now is creating smaller SWAT teams, if you will, of people that are devoted to awareness content, people that are, are devoted to demand gen content and the, and the product marketing component as, a, as disciplines. Each one of those people on the team now has somebody reporting directly to them that can help support them in working out the strategy for each one of these disciplines. Across each one of them, we have our sales enablement ca uh, capability, we have our alliances and partners, uh, 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 line of business and competency that we support, and obviously our content operations that keep the trains running on time, et cetera. But this model is something that we feel is gonna enable us to act with more agility. Um, I can also tell you from personal experience, again, I've not been at Dun & Bradstreet for that long, but you know, we're, we're not a huge company, but we're not a small one. We have a lot of complexities. We operate sometimes very slowly and it drives me bonkers. We are slow with time to market. We are slow with decision making. We're slow getting data to make actionable insights from it. We feel that this model is gonna help speed things up to some extent, but it also is then really kind of applying best practices to the stages of the customer journey. Um, and that really is at the forefront of everything we do, understanding what the needs of our, of our audiences are, of the people that we're trying to target, and giving them the stuff that's actually gonna be meaningful to them. All, again, based on data. The good news is as well, um, we are on the product marketing side, that model that I had just described to you, um, has prompted our leadership team to make some new hires, which we're doing right now, to bring on board uh, product marketers that will sit on the product marketing team. So we'll have even more balance between content marketing and product marketing. So um, the second bullet point here is talking about looking, working together to create objectives that are gonna meet the needs of the business without sacrificing messaging integrity. How many writers are there in the room here? You guys, are you struggling with making sure that the way that you're crafting your messaging and strategy, do you feel like your vision from the beginning is what your actual output is at the end? Show of hands, yes? Some, not many. So it, it's an issue, um, and it especially is an issue when you have journalists, former journalists, marketers working alongside of sales and, and, and product folks that have a deep understanding of the nuts and bolts of the products and solutions, but as well as the sales cycle. The trick here is to make sure that the vision, the strategic vision of how you want to tell a story remains intact. And again, I think it was said in an earlier session, the shoot from the hip and gut approach, journalistic instinct, I think Journalists and writers will always have that, but we want to rationalize as much of those things as possible and validate them with data. So we use, a lot of, we use as much data as we possibly can to get to that rationalization. That then helps us paint a picture and make a case for why we want to continue with a narrative that looks like X, Y, and Z versus having it go off course. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it really is all about process. I, I can't stress this enough. Um, I think within Dun & Bradstreet, every one of those factions that I had described earlier, everyone's doing things a little bit differently and there's no real unification. The problem with that is that you have, you have operations operating in pockets and in silos and you can easily see how somebody doing something over here is not doing the same thing as somebody over here and if they're not talking, at the end of the day, you're at risk for producing content that's either redundant, it's off messaging, it doesn't have that common narrative thread, and it doesn't actually meet the needs of, of the people that you're trying to reach uh, within the customer sphere. So that alignment across disciplines is really important, as is governance. That's a hard thing to do. Um, we don't have a formal project management discipline within our content marketing framework. Um, we sorely need one. People are serving now as project managers when they, we don't really uh, 
They shouldn't really be doing that, but out of sheer necessity, we're operating in that mode for right now. Um, but that is helping us maintain governance with the, with the processes that we abide by. And again, I, I, a lot of us on, on my team were former journalists, were former writers, TV producers, uh, radio personalities, etc. We have this drive to produce content built within us. And um, you know, a lot of us have come from writing for publications and uh, you know, as, as well as, as TV shows, etc. Um, but we also have a lot of agency background too. And I think for a brand, um, like DNB, which has been around for a long, long time, 175 years, if you can believe it. Um, there's not been a lot of agency practicality and rigor and discipline imbued within the way that we operate. Um, and that's changing. We, uh, over the course of the past five years, our organization as a whole has undergone a massive transformation, brought in a lot of new people that have agency and publishing background to, again, take some of the best practices from those models and apply it to what we do. But this bullet point list, it should, it should be straightforward. You would think, right? Hey, here it's a project brief. Let's all start from this kind of one single source of truth and have funneled into it every bit of information that you would need to cover off on a project. We're not really great at, or we weren't really great at doing that um, a couple years ago. It was one of those things that was looked at as like a nice to have. And it's a must have. If you don't have that, projects are gonna go off course you're probably not going to end up with the results that you want to at the end of the day, and that's bad for everybody. Um, stakeholder identification. This is a problem as well if you don't figure out who the right people are up front to be reviewing content, to be providing subject matter expertise up front. If you don't select the right people up front, that will cause churn as you go through the production process of creating uh, creating content, whether it's product-specific, solution-specific, or, or top funnel stuff as well. Uh, process concurrent workflows versus linear. One of the things that, um, that we struggle with is all those different factions, all those different lines of business not only have their own processes, but even within our, our disciplines of the web team, the creative team, the MarTech team, the analytics team, we all have a different way of doing things. And unfortunately, a lot of that is just ending up being I'm gonna pass the baton from my content team to the creative team, they're gonna design something, then we give it to the web team, they're gonna prep it to put it on the web, then it's gonna activate on the web, then the paid media team's gonna do its thing, and then we're gonna have our analytics team measure it. Why can't we have things operating concurrently? So we're trying to, to do more of that so that we speed time to market um, versus taking umpteen days or weeks to actually produce something and get it in market. The last point here is the realistic ex expectations for turnaround. Um, there is no F8 key on any keyboard that you could press that's going to instantly produce a glorious white paper that's going to result in massive conversion for any audience or any person that you're trying to, to target. Uh, these things take time. Content creators know that. It's another thing that when you build that into a project brief to set realistic goals of how long this is actually going to take, you can, you can Pump out a blog in, in you know, a matter of an hour. But a video, probably going to take a lot longer than that. A white paper, a lot longer than that, too. So setting those realistic expectations is actually very, very key. So by way of example, what happens if you don't do those things? And I'll just tell you um, a short story about uh, right after I joined Dun & Bradstreet and right after Thanksgiving, end of the year, $100,000 mysteriously appeared from somebody's budget, and it was a use it or lose it situation. So they came to us and said, hey, we have this 100 grand. Can you guys spend it and make some really cool product videos? We wanted to extend an experience that we had a very focused customer uh, specific event where a hand, I think 15 or 20 hand-picked customers came in and we gave them one-on-one -on -one product demos. But th that was it. They got the demo, they left, it was all good. I mean, it was, it was a, a viable and valuable exercise. But we wanted to extend that experience and, and build some consistent product marketing videos, two minutes a piece, thereabout, that would touch on the, the, the highlights, the features and benefits of our solutions without going so deep into the weeds. But it would whet the appetite of people to let them know what these products and solutions were actually meant to do, again, to help people overcome the challenges that they, within their spheres of of business 
we're feeling. So that was an exciting project. The unfortunate part is we got word right after Thanksgiving that we had to spend 100 grand by the end of the year and get a lot of stuff done within a month. And so don't forget, right after Thanksgiving, there are the December holidays. So people were already off on vacation. And so we scrambled to find the right people, the right stakeholders, to provide us with that information that we needed to get at, our writers to get at, to craft scripts, to tell the right story in a very short, poetic schema. With a, with a two minute video, you, can't really go into a lot of detail. Every word has to be chosen very well, and I, I view that as poetry. By the way, I stink at poetry. I am good at running on and on and on like I'm doing right now. Um, it's easier to do that. It's hard, really, really hard to write something very pithy and concise and have it be potent and meaningful. So that net, we started things rolling. We had people that were working over the holidays in this stuff. At the end of the day, without going into bloody detail, um, the, what we ended up having happen was right after the holidays, people came back from vacation and said, well, why didn't you ask me to participate in this? I should have been consulted. I'm the, I'm the product person on this. Well, you weren't available, so we had to go to this person. Oh, well, we have to redo this script. So we did a lot of redos after things were already locked, and that was costly in terms of money, and it was costly in terms of time. What should have been a project that yielded a dozen or so videos within a month, I think we finally got everything wrapped up in May. That is so late that a couple of those videos, the product names changed. A couple of those videos, we had, uh, we had worked in, partner, in partnership with some of our alliances folks, some of our, our external partners. And some of them were no longer partners of ours. So if you don't do it right up front, this is the kind of thing that happens. And it was really, really painful. At the end of the day, the videos are all, they're great. We fixed everything. They all look good. But there was a lot, there was an easier way of doing it, a far more efficient way of doing it. And that all goes back to alignment. What does it look like when you do have those things happen? So about a year ago, we, uh, a little more than a year ago, we made an acquisition. We, we bought a company called Avention, and they had a, pro, uh, a product called OneSource that we folded into the DNB ecosystem. And we crafted a, uh, a, a, pro, a product called DNB Hoovers from that. A uh, very successful product, uh, geared primarily for smaller businesses, but, but larger businesses could use it as well. But what we were able to do with that, with that work stream was we, we learned from a, a previous go-to-market product launch that if you mess things up from the beginning, like that video example that I just mentioned, bad things can happen. You know, you don't want to, if you're late with a product launch, that is never a good thing. So we knew that we needed to be really on time and, and on our game. So we adopted the, the agency mentality of having a project brief. We had regular check-ins and touch points with the product marketing folks, the content marketing folks, the sales folks, the executives. We handpicked the right stakeholders who would need to lean in. Not everyone and their mother needed to attend every meeting. That tends to slow things down, by the way. So we tried to really expedite the process as much as we could. And the net result was we were able to do a lot of stuff in a short amount of time. And by a lot of stuff, I mean, with the Avention acquisition, there were several hundred web pages that we needed to either update and modify or sunset. And we rapidly went through all of those, figured out, did a gap analysis, figured out what could stay, what could go. Um, so it was a, an extraordinarily large amount of content that was, that was done well very, very quickly. The other good part was by planning properly, getting the right people involved from day one, we had messaging consistency across the board. That was also key um, in terms of making sure that over the long haul, these assets can still perform effectively without having to go back to every single one of them and check to make sure, did we get this one right over here? We talked about something over here in this, in this blog, but did we actually, was it the same thing that we said in this, in this video or in this landing page? We planned effectively so we didn't have to worry about that. We had really good, strong cross-linking from asset to asset, from the top, middle, and lower funnel. Um, and the net result of that is just a, a better experience for people that were actually consuming the content. So when you do those things and you do them right, 
you get good results out of it. Um, the third point here is data-driven insights. That is something that we try to do. We try to gather as much data as possible up front from SEO, from social listening, from customer marketplace research, from paid media, from, uh, from performance, from our analytics team of asset performance, and then meld them all into an engine that helps us figure out what our next steps logically should be. That takes a lot of the, the gut out of things, a lot of the guesswork out of things. So in terms of you know, what does that look like, it's upfront discovery. Um, it's, it's not just what people want to learn about, but it's also figuring out what do they not want to know about? What don't they need to worry about? What can they get from some other source? That is as equally as important as figuring out what are your specific needs. On the back end, again, performance data. Um, is our stuff working well or not? Do we need to, if something's been activated in market and it's three months later and it's hitting our benchmarks of success, awesome. If it's overperforming, even better. But if it's underperforming, how do we optimize? When do we optimize? How much depth of optimization do we need? Are we talking about a, a change to a headline with different SEO keywords? Do we have to rewrite a segment of the, of the piece itself? Do we have to put new artwork in place? Do we have to position it differently where it lives? All those things help us figure out how much investment of, of time and money and effort went in up front to create really good stuff and how that can be applied over the long haul to make sure that you don't have to create something net new every time you want to do something different. You can optimize existing content. We have this philosophy, it's a methodology at this point called what I call the Editorial Insights Engine, and it really is all about that. It's taking all of those data streams and funneling them into this engine so that we have data-driven insights at the beginning of things to help inform what our topics and our, our key pillar topics and themes should be based on what our customers and our, our, our prospects and the people that we're trying to target are telling us that they need. And then from there, we go to task and actually create the content. We activate it, we measure how, how it performs in field. Again, we look to optimize it. And those learnings from optimization, it's a feedback loop, right? It's this kind of an infinite loop of wisdom that you can use in discovery and, and, and optimization on the back end to make sure that you're always giving, the, giving people what is actually that they're looking for at any, at any moment in time. Um, the fourth point here is to talk about writing styles. And I think for anybody that's a writer, this is near and dear, or should be near and dear to your heart too. Voice, tone, style, um, we pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and I think that there's probably a lot of folks that don't really understand why we do, but we'll talk a little bit about it. And honestly, for us, you know, the strafing the landscape with the one-size-fits-all message um, is marginally effective. You can't use the same tone and voice and style of writing for a CIO for a large enterprise organization as you would for an IT manager for a 25-person shop. They're going to be interested in some of the same things, but a smaller shop IT manager is not going to have a bit of interest in how master data and a master data management strategy is going to help them uncover new insights across various different disciplines within a 10,000 employee organization. CIO for a large enterprise probably will. So figuring out who you're trying to actually give relevant messaging to is key in how you write the story, how you shoot the video, how you create the infographic, the level and depth of complexity for a white paper, for example. You know, there's probably gonna be some smaller businesses that have interest in reading in-depth white papers about technical subject X, Y, and Z, um, but, but on the whole, probably not. Your analytics, your discovery, your data-driven insights will help you uncover not just the themes and topics that are gonna be of most resonance to the people that you're trying to reach, but how they like to consume content. You know, who here doesn't like watching videos? I think probably we all do. But there's probably a lot of people that, if they're traveling, maybe they don't, they're not able to watch a video. Maybe, they're, maybe they prefer podcasts, maybe a certain persona type or a customer type or, or you know, person by person prefers to read a, a, a short form piece of content versus a long article. We all have different preferences as humans, and we need to figure out from a brand standpoint 
how we're actually giving people messaging that's going to be consumed in a way that they want it to be consumed. Not what we think. What the, oh, yeah, video. Yeah, everybody love, loves video. Let's just produce a whole lot of videos. If it's rationalized by data, all, by all means. If it's not rationalized by data, then we, we tend not to do it. So, you know, in addition to the different types of people that we're, we're targeting, we have different levels of size of organization, from very small shops to mid-level organizations to enterprises there too. The tone and the style and the voice that we adopt in terms of our writing style should, should, uh, should align to those. Um, and then one example here, sales and marketing professionals. We talk about sales and marketing all the time as being this single unified thing. Well, salespeople and marketing people, are, they have different goals. They have, they're doing different things. They should be talking with each other. They should be using the same data. They should be uh, collaborating more effectively with one another. And oftentimes, at least from, from what we've seen at, uh, at DNB and, and even beyond that, that oftentimes just is not the case. So it's all about making sure that your messaging is targeted to the right, the right individual. And when we talk about voice, tone, and style, there's a glut of information out there that anyone can access at any time because the internet is just so huge and there's so much info. What's the right info for you? We try to stand out from above the crowd with voice, tone, and style that's gonna actually meet the needs of the people that we're trying to target. So when we talk about that, we talk about wanting to be experts in our field. And when we're experts in our field, we, we adopt a, a tone that's authoritative and it's declarative in terms of the way that we write. The trick is we don't want to come off as being arrogant, but we want to be expert in, our, in, in the way that we, that we actually tell a story. We also want to be human, and that means giving practical advice that people can actually use, being helpful and being informative. How-tos are a great, a great way of doing this. You give somebody guidance and show them how to do something that's it's highly valuable content. And then lastly, I don't know about all of, of the brands that are represented within this room, um, but I think within most of what you probably do, there's a lot of complexity. And it's very easy to get deep into the weeds with that complexity and lose sight of some of the, the way that we talk to people. If you're an engineer, maybe you're gonna wanna hear things in engineer speak. Um, but if you're a marketing person or a salesperson, you're probably not going to be needing the same type of information in the same language necessarily. So we try to speak as, in as much as uh, a plain English as we possibly can. Simplicity that makes us approachable goes back to humanization as well. The last point here um, before we, we wrap um, is making sure that we activate this stuff to people where they currently are. We don't want, we don't want to have people hunt, hunting and pecking for stuff. We want to make sure that we figure out what are the spaces that they're playing in. Are they on, are they on YouTube a lot? Are they, are they coming to our website quite a bit? Are they, what publications are they, are they reading? How we position our content externally as well as internally is key uh, in, in giving people actually what they want. So I, I mentioned it before, you, know, we need, you need to be where your customers are. Um, give them the asset types that they prefer versus making a presumption that, oh, everyone loves videos or everyone loves blogs, et cetera. It should be a, a good mix of assets based on data that informs you what, what person, what profession, what level of organization and, and content uh, consumption preferences that person actually wants. The other thing, too, is to give, give it to people when they need it. I mentioned earlier, too, that oftentimes the way that we do things because of that very linear time frame and workflow, we are very slow. And at sometimes um, we're so slow, in fact, that the messaging is outdated by the time it gets to somebody. That's terrible. You've just wasted a whole bunch of time and effort and money planning for something that is, could be a brilliant piece of content. But if you don't get it out there, if you don't deploy it at the right time and get it in the hands of people when it's relevant, it's for naught. Um, and that's more than a shame. That could end up being you know, a very, very deep problem uh, for an organization. So, so like I said, when we talk about this stuff, it's all, alignment is about harmony and working in collaboration with each other up front. I'm going to leave you with a bit of an eye chart of a slide, but it's my favorite slide of any deck that we've ever done at Dunham Bradstreet because it, it summarizes the way that we're viewing things in terms of alignment across the board. So we call this the inverted pyramid of Dun & Bradstreet content. 
And it's the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So for us, it starts with looking at where people are, right? What channels are they in? Are they on, do they prefer to consume their content on a website? Um, are they on social media a lot? What kind of strategies uh, in terms of the channels are we adopting from the get-go to figure out where, where the messaging should be delivered? When do we give it to people? Well, what stage of the customer journey? We need to make sure that we're not just doing a lot of one-offs, but we're, doing a content, we're creating a content collection so that when somebody comes in to our website, whether they're in the middle of the funnel or the, top, or the top or the bottom, they can go left or right based on whatever their needs are. Um, when it comes to making sure that we're tracking the, the story to make sure that it aligns to the right competency, you know, we have, we have multiple competencies, so a master data story is probably not going to be uh, as resonant as it, as it would for a CFO who plays within the, the finance, credit, and risk space. So we have to make sure that the story matches the LOB and the specific needs of that line of business and the people that comprise that line of business. Those people, by the way, have different levels of, of experience, th different needs. A CFO is going to be looking at things much differently than a credit manager, for example. How do we get the right messaging to each one of those individual people that we're trying to target? Um, and then for us as a brand, we have cardinal tenets of how we operate. We, we have three things that we try to abide by in terms of our foundational principles. Our stories need to be told in that way as well, so that they come across as being inherently generous. We have this relentless curiosity about us as a natural part of a data company, as you would imagine, so that has to come through within our messaging too. Um, and then being inspired by data, using insights from various different data streams to get at the, the actionable insights that you can take in terms of your next steps to achieve success with your partners across your organization. And for us, again, I mean, it goes back to growing valuable relationships through data. And the relationship building could be, it's broad enough to encompass a business relationship, a partnership, the way that you actually work and operate with other teams like we've been discussing today between content marketing and product marketing. So if you have this type of alignment, you really have harmony. This is the holy grail of harmony, as it were. So I'll leave you with this. These are three, three key questions or, or watch outs um, just to think about. And it really is, it goes back to that initial question. Are you talking enough? Are you collaborating enough with your teams, with your product marketing teams, and beyond that, to make sure you're in lockstep with each other? You have a common shared vision, and then that vision is adhered to from start to finish throughout your, your content creation process. Um, how often are you actually having those touch points of collaboration? Is it once a week? Is it once a day? Is it one, whatever it is, you figure out what the right cadence is, and make sure that it's an ongoing open dialogue. And then the last part is the sharing of data. We all have data silos. It is, it's one of the biggest problems I think that organizations face. How can we actually use similar systems to have the same data within it that we're all looking at the same nuggets of, of gold to have those actionable insights? So that's it. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions either now in the, in the one minute and 20 seconds that we have left, and I'm sorry about that, um, or send me an email. My email is uh, yeichc at dnb.com. And thank you for your time.